Hello, welcome to another episode of Called Premiers. Um, I'm, I'm so glad to have two very uh, insightful personalities, professionals, called Premiers with me today. Uh, they are not strangers to this program. Um, Teresa and Tendai, we are with us at the very first episode when we introduce uh, car premiers. Uh, so they've, they've been with me before, um, but I'm just glad that they are here with me again today. So I just want to allow uh, Theresa and Tendai to introduce themselves. Um, but before doing that, if I may just uh, put a little bit of more um, basis for Court Premiers. Um, Court Premiers is an initiative of Multicultural Professional Bridge, which uh, facilitates uh, participation and value for people across the board, especially called and multicultural people. Um, just recently, the idea of uh, getting to entrepreneurship, uh, which is what Corpreneur is all about, uh, valuing diversity in business. And I still remember that, uh, just to clarify again, called is culturally and linguistically diverse people, again, multicultural migrant people. Um, and I remember this key punchline, which is, Give a man a, a, a fish, you feed him for a day, but teach a man or a woman to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. This is the core of uh, the driver for core premiums. Um, and and I, I always like stealing this man's thunder, which is Tendai, one of us today, came up with this extra level. Uh, rather than talking about fish or fishes, why not just own the pond? Uh, so that is one of the key, another key level of uh, court premiums. So it, it's all about entrepreneurship, uh, which is one thing we'll be talking about today. But before we go into the topic, can I just bring in Tendai and Theresa now just to introduce themselves uh, for the sake of uh, our audience? <coughs> Those that will watch this later get to meet, put uh, names to the faces. Can we start with Teresa, please? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Teresa Demden, and I am the founder and owner of Elevate Business Culture. So at Elevate Business Culture, I work with people that are in a startup stage of their business. This is where I help them uh, with their business ideation as well as um, to helping them develop their business plan and also we might go on into managing their business. So that's mostly what I do. Thank you. Tendai, please. Thank you, Ephraim, and uh, thanks for bringing us back to your program. Uh, my name is Tendai Muchemwa and I'm a business incubator manager with uh, Business Station. Yes, I do take the rights that I did say that uh, we should own the ponds rather than learning how to fish. So I think that's something that we all want uh, uh, to do. So just to give you a, a brief overview about Business Station, Business Station helps small businesses to grow. And that is our vision to help all small businesses to grow. We do understand that it is a lonely ride and you cannot do it by yourself. So we try to equip small business owners with the right uh, skills to help them grow. So I do manage a business incubator. And as I jokingly say all the times, a lot of people think that I manage chickens, but I do manage businesses in this business incubator. And we have about 33 businesses in this business incubator that I manage. Thank you, Tendai. Uh, my own name is Ephraim Osaya. I, I lead the Multicultural Professional Bridge, which is the parent body for court premiums. Now, just coming to the topic of today, uh, uh, entrepreneurship, I think Tendai's introduction there brings it home. You manage businesses 
every day you incubate businesses. Um, I just want, to, want you to launch us into this topic of today uh, because entrepreneurship sometimes takes people to different areas. So we just want to break it down today, unpack it, set the right foundation for people that will want to be entrepreneurs. So tonight, take us into it, just what, what is entrepreneurship? All right, thank you, Ephraim. I cannot think of a better way to describe what entrepreneurship is without going back to how it originated. So we want to go back to the 13th century where this word came from. Unfortunately, I'm not very good with French. I could have pronounced the word itself that was taken from the French word entrepreneur. So what it meant in the 13th century was just simply to undertake or to venture. So that's what it meant in the 13th century. Now in the 16th century, they modified the definition a little bit. Now this is someone who ventures into business. Now the moment you use the word venture, you are talking about a risk. Now, without sounding too academic, I also want to touch briefly the definition by Harvard Business School, and they define entrepreneurship as the pursuit of opportunity beyond resources controlled. So what it simply means is when you want to start a business, for example, you are going to need resources. Now, Anyone can do anything if they are given the resources to do those things. But when you don't have enough resources to do or to undertake this venture, you are now said to be an entrepreneur. You're not waiting to have all the resources that are required. Now, just to break this down in layman terms, the definition that I thought that we all can understand what entrepreneurship is, it is the activity of setting up a business or businesses, taking on financial risks in the hope of making a profit. Now, there are three fundamental words that are there. You are venturing or starting a business and you are taking financial risk in the hope of making a profit. So I would define an entrepreneur as someone who wants to do an activity which will bring a profit. And this is not an easy thing because a risk has to be taken. That's my understanding of entrepreneurship. Thank you, Tendai. I, I, I think uh, Parisa may just want to chip in a bit there. I'll leave that definition there because uh, like Tendai already said, we're going to be taking some punch lines, some few keywords on an ongoing basis. But let me allow you to come in here, Teresa. You you help people to set up businesses. You, you work with people every day just to see that they get off on a good path. So what, what do you think about this topic, Teresa? Well, Ephraim, it's a very important topic because a lot of people um, don't understand or actually are not aware of what it takes to be an entrepreneur. So Tendai has summed it up very well. And uh, what I would add is that um, entrepreneurship is having the ability and the capacity, also willingness to develop, organize, and manage a business venture. At the same time, taking up risks, finding new opportunities that can lead you into actually running a business. So... Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, obviously we the the even with with Teresa's uh, definition there is still coming down to those three key words: taking up a venture or activity, taking up some risk, and making a profit. Now the the next thing that really really sometimes cause a lot of questions, uh, Tinda and Teresa, is this whole thing about who then is an entrepreneur? And I think we need to break it down because uh, some people, 
in the audience, people that will watch this later may think, uh, how can I be an entrepreneur? It's not for me. It's, it's, it's for the selected few. It is for stars. It is for locals, even for core people. Say, so, oh, I cannot, who, who can I sell to? How can I do business? You know, what's my chance? How can I even get it off the ground? So I want us to, because the essence of this topic today is just also to leave people with some hope, leave them with some encouragement, knowing that with the state we are now with COVID, and also I, I, I will take advantage of the current China situation, <laughs> you know, even though we're not trying to be political yet, it opens up opportunities. So what do you think about who is an entrepreneur? Let me start with Teresa this time around. Okay. Um, an entrepreneur is a person that creates a business. So anyone can be an, I would say anyone can be an entrepreneur if they're interested in becoming one. First of all, one has to ask my, themselves, do I want to add to economic advancement? So by adding to economic advancement is um, when someone decides to either start a business and um, add to the economy. Another way of looking at it is someone who has been looking for work, they can't find work and they decide to become self-employed. So you can be self-employed as an entrepreneur and run your own business and manage your own funds and make profits and, you know, have all the risks that's available, you know, where, when it comes to being an entrepreneur and running a business. So really, um, if you are interested in becoming an entrepreneur, it can be done. But first of all, you need to have an idea, either a business idea. If you don't have a business idea, you can always look at what's already available, what services are being offered. If there are services that you know you've got the skill that you can do, you can always start your own business or become an entrepreneur offering those services. As well as sometimes people um, can look at Amazon for example, they can look at Amazon and find out what products are selling well. And they can, in turn, start selling those products themselves, either locally or on the platform itself or to uh, in, in, at a place or at a location where they can find those uh, customers that are interested in those products. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. I, I, I really, I mean, from what you, I, I think you've said it over and over again. Sometimes you can start it as a hobby because sometimes people just think um, it takes so much to start a business, you know, but hey, you can start from somewhere. Uh, so I'll come back to you, Teresa, because I know that's the area that you help people to get it going. But uh, Tendai, you, you incubate businesses. I just want you to use this question to highlight the different type of businesses that you've seen. Because sometimes people think that, you know, uh, it takes too much to start a business. Uh, but I'm sure in your incubating businesses, not chickens, you've, you've, seen, you've seen a lot of different kind of business or businesses. So what do you, who can be a business person or an entrepreneur? Please help us here. Uh, thank you, Ephraim. So this question, I like it because there's so much research that has been done to try and address this question, who is an entrepreneur? And I think one of the questions that has been asked is, are entrepreneurs born or they're made? And a lot of people are always struggling to answer that question. Am I born an entrepreneur, or I can learn to be an entrepreneur. And the fortunate thing about it is all various researchers have not come to a conclusion that they all agree on, on whether an entrepreneur is born or is made. 
which opens the rest to pretty much everyone else. But what, how I want to answer this is, I think entrepreneurs are ordinary people like you and I. And the reason why I say that is I have started, uh, and I, I would like to use this example because you mentioned COVID-19 uh, earlier on, and there's no better time to talk about Zoom, you know, with conference calling, because almost everyone knows how to use Zoom these days. Now, the owner of Zoom or the founder of Zoom, his name is Eric Yuan. And this guy comes from China. Now, when he was in 18 years old, what he did was he was in college and he had his then girlfriend, who is now his wife, uh, attend a college which was far away from where he was. And he needed about 10 hours of train ride to go and see his girlfriend. And you'd only see his girlfriend only twice a year simply because the distance was just too much. Now, he imagined a world where he could just talk to his girlfriend anytime he wanted without being there physically. But there was just a world which didn't exist at the time. Now, fast forward that to uh, when he was 27 years old, that's about 10 years later, he, he, he applied uh, for a visa to go to the United States of America because he felt this is where he could make his dream come true. Unfortunately, his visa was denied eight times. And the ninth time, that's when he was accepted. Fortunately, when he got there, uh, he worked for a company uh, that was then called Cisco and then become a vice president. I'm getting somewhere with this. Oh. Now, Eric decided then to leave that job. He was a vice president. It was earning a lot of money in that company. He decided to pursue his dream, to start that business that he wanted of seeing his girlfriend face to face without physically being there. And we all know now Zoom is a multi-billion dollar business. Oh, and oh. Uh, he's, more than, he's worth now more than nine billion. He pursued uh, the vision that he had seen. Now, the reason why I'm mentioning this is Eric at that time was just an ordinary person who experienced a problem of missing his girlfriend and it needed so much time to go and see her. And then he just thought about an ideal world where things could get better if he was to do something and he decided to implement it. This is just an ordinary person, just like you and I, who has identified a problem. Now, I'll quickly give you another example because I always like to use this example because it's an incubation example. Oh. We all know Airbnb. Airbnb is a very fascinating story and I love it. I can go the whole day talking about it. It was started by three boys who had gone to a graphic designing school. Now, these guys were unemployed after graduation, something that happens to almost every one of us and they had bills to pay in the flats that they, were rent, that they were renting. Now, it so happened, you know what happens when you are so unemployed? Bills will keep chasing you. Now, the rent was needed, and there was no money to pay for this rent. What these guys decided to do, they knew there was a conference that was taking place, and they say to themselves, what if we were to get some air beds, you know, those beds that you can put air inside. Oh. What if we get some air beds, right? We can get some people who are coming to attend uh, this conference. We can make them pay for, for, for this air bed. We'll make them breakfast in the morning. And then when you make breakfast, we'll charge them. They will probably like to come here because there are some people who are very sensitive to prices so they will not want to go to hotels. Oh. If they can come here, we make them sleep on an air bed, we make them breakfast, we can get paid. And they oh. tried that. They actually got two clients who then paid uh, for their accommodation and then they made them breakfast. So those were their first two clients. To cut the long story short, Airbnb was born 
because of that innovativeness. So I'm coming back, I'm coming back again to that point. These are just ordinary people who are unemployed, just like what happens to all of us. Oh. And at times you're unemployed because you think maybe I don't have what it takes to be getting a job, you know? But these guys managed to get, um, they managed to, to, to create an idea out of a crisis and then it turned out to be a billion dollar business. So oh. in my opinion, um, entrepreneurship or one becoming an entrepreneur does not need any special skill. You just need to identify a crisis, a problem that you seek to solve, and oh. that makes you an entrepreneur. Wow, wow. And also, yes, go on, uh, and also, and I, with Eric, you mentioned that he was persistent. He decided to go to America to follow his dream. He was denied a visa eight times. Oh. By the second time, a lot of people would have given up. But in life, if you're persistent and keep trying to follow your dream, you might get somewhere. And also, it's also a good idea to be action-oriented. Say, for example, with the Airbnb guys, they probably heard that a lot of accommodation was filled and there were people looking for other accommodation. So they decided to jump on that opportunity and get air mattresses and charge people to sleep on those air mattresses as well as add on value to what they were offering cook breakfast in the morning that gave them more extra income at the end of it all so my addition to this is that you need to be persistent and you need to be action oriented you need to start somewhere and start doing Wow, that was, I, I couldn't complete it perfectly, Teresa, because you've just gone ahead to, to start addressing one of the, the third item, you know, what does it take? But I'll just go back to Tendai's story there, very, very inspirational. I know that uh, when Tendai shares the MBRB story, I think I've heard it before, but every time I hear it, it inspires me because it is a story of ordinary people. And then just the way Teresa completed it, persistency and action orientation or action uh, oriented, which is what this issue of what does it take? And I really want us to bring it home now to call to multicultural people, to migrant people, to people that think they've come to a new place, they don't have the network, they don't have the, uh, just that item network is big. They don't have classmates that they went to school with. They don't know all the places they could get cheap labor. So the question sometimes, they even give up before they start. And I just want us to speak to those people. Of course, other, other people can learn from this. But I want us to really direct our attention now to people of migrant and multicultural background. How can they be entrepreneurs in a new place that they've relocated to? What do you guys think? I think this is a good question. All right. Can I start on that one? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, the reason why I started or I mentioned Eric for Zoom is because you will notice that I said he's from China and then he went to the United States. You can tell now this is the cowed people we are talking about. Exactly. He's one person who is from another country, migrates to another country and still makes his business successful. I'm sure you must have heard about what well, we all know, PayPal. PayPal again, was started or founded by migrants. Now, these are people who had problems. So in other words, I think this gets more exciting because I would say, is there anyone without a problem who oh, is a migrant? Oh, if oh. the answer is no, then I would say it's very difficult to be entrepreneur. But if the answer oh. is yes, then that means there are just so many opportunities that are there for oh. all migrants. So for as long there is for as long there is a problem, 
there's an entrepreneur opportunity for all migrants. I mentioned PayPal because again, these are people who had problems with sending money back home because there was no platform to do that. They are the migrants, they want to send money to their family and friends, but there's no platform to do that. They decided to create a platform and PayPal was born. So I think the migrants have got better opportunities because they've got, I don't know if this is the right word, they've got better problems. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, <laughs> but... <laughs> well, since you know what I'm writing, but keep going on. Let me finish what I'm writing. <laughs> so, 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 so for as long as there are problems, then there are opportunities for becoming entrepreneur. I think that's where all this comes from. Problems are equal to opportunities. Now, I just want to touch on something again, uh, briefly. The idea is all about perception. When others are complaining, you must always be looking for an opportunity. I want to use a very quick example about Bata, a company called Bata, it's a shoe manufacturing company and it's quite prominent in Africa. I'm told at the beginning of the 19th century, uh, so many shoe manufacturers from around the world were sending people to Africa, their sales reps, to go and see if there was an opportunity to be able to manufacture shoes and sell them to Africans. Now, most of these sales representatives came back to their mother countries and they were saying, well, most people in Africa do not put on shoes. I don't see, or we don't see any reason why we can make it in Africa because the market is not conducive they don't put on shoes. So that's not a good market. But Bata looked at things differently. Bata went on to say, well, there's no one who puts on shoes in Africa. What an opportunity here in Africa to make shoes for these people who do not put on shoes. So what is the point home here? The point is, it's all about perceptions. If we look around us, some of the problems that we think are problems are actually opportunities that we can make use to our advantage. I'll just use one example before uh, Teresa steps in. Now, we all know that if you want to play a game, right, or games are usually for boys. Boys play games or men play games because there are quite a lot of men that play games now these days. Now, Games are games for men, right? But there's someone who saw an opportunity that why is it always that it's just the men and the boys that play games? What about the women? So someone created a game that included women. And I think most of you have played this game called Candy Crush. Candy Crush... <laughs> was designed by someone who noticed that there are so many people, so many women who are not playing games because games are said to be for men and for boys. And now so many women play, play Candy Crush. Sweet, divine, and they all know those words. And do you notice they even played around with the colors, pink, all those lovely colors that are appealing to women. So we always have to be looking for opportunities when others think that this is a competitive environment. I will tell you, Ephraim, if you wanted to make a game of your own, you would be thinking about making another game for boys, which is different from the other games that are there. It's such a bloody competitive environment. Yes, there are girls and women who have not played a game in their life. I know there are some people that play games, but then there were so many that hadn't played games. Now they were playing Candy Crush. So opportunities are always around us if we take the eye to look at them. That, wow. that, that, that's what I just wanted to say in my second example. Wow, then uh, I think it needs, I need a trailer to stop you sometimes, a passion. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know what, Tendai, you've just confirmed why I'm addicted to Candy Crush. 
course. Oh, I didn't um, know. I didn't I know you played. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I actually with my brother-in-law. We we chase each other and pass each other, and yeah, that's our thing. But I actually realized so I was the target audience, and it actually shows why you know it, I'm so into the game. So <laughs> coming back to you know my migrants, how can they start businesses, and how can they look for opportunities? As migrants, when we move to another um, country or location, it means we carry skills or we know things that are not where we end up migrating. So coming to Australia, there are things that are done in Zambia, where I come from, and are not here in Australia. So that's where the opportunity is. That's where I can look and find ways to actually start that business or start doing those services that are not here. Oh. And as a migrant, it's always important not to just, you know, stick to your own community. It's always important to branch out and mingle with people that are not in your community. That way you'll be able to find opportunities that you would have not learned about if you stuck to your community. As well as in every country, or for example, if I just stick to Australia, when you come to Australia, there's so, lots of support um, organizations that can help you. You can start off by going to your local council and just finding out uh, what sort of programs do you have for migrants? Or this is my experience. I'm new to this place. How can you help me? They will be willing to help you. Your neighbors, your school, um, you know, friends, or even like school parents. If you talk to them, it's always about talking, asking questions, and uh, telling your story. When you tell your story, there's always going to be someone that can link you to how, to some somewhere, an organization or a support group that can help nature you. As well as another thing is that it is important to find mentors. Mentors are people that are doing things that you want to do, things that you aspire to do. A lot of times, uh, people may be afraid to approach uh, mentors thinking they might, not, you know, they might reject me because I'm aspiring to do what they are doing. It's not always the case. What I've found is that they are they're always willing to embrace you, to help you get to where they are or to just direct you so that you can start doing what they're doing because they've got experience. They've done it before, they've made mistakes. So they're able to direct you and help you. So as a migrant, I encourage you to look for avenues, look for support. There's always support. There's sometimes if you can't find anyone, just Google it. Go online and Google what sort of help is available. It will all come out. So, yeah. And also, when as a migrant, when you think of, um, you, you, you decide to start a business, it's always important to do your market research. Because if you only talk to your family and friends, they will encourage you and say, yes, this business is, is a good idea. Go ahead and do it. But it's important before you start doing it, to conduct research. Where are my target audiences? Who, which people are going to buy the services or products that I'm going to offer? Is the location appropriate? Are the customers going to find me here? Or do I have to move to a location where I can find those customers? It's important to do your market research. This can be primary or secondary. I will explain what primary is. Primary is feedback from your existing customers or people that may be interested in your uh, products or services. Secondary research is information that's already available. This is information you can find on your competitors' websites or just um, reading books and things like that. So conducting primary and secondary research is always important because it will give you the information that you need to start the business. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. I just want to bring in Monica. Monica is uh, my colleague. Uh, it's it's so glad to, to see you online, Monica. And, and she, she just flagged uh, a good point, which is just to highlight what Teresa was mentioning in terms of getting out of our comfort zone as people of color background. Uh, I did I did flag there so just now that building these networks takes time. So we shouldn't just expect that when you start meeting people today, they will become your client overnight. So it takes time to build. Once again, I just want to acknowledge Teresa. Thank you so much, Teresa, for that point. Thank you for being with us. Uh, stay with us as much as you can, but I really appreciate Keep Keep bringing your comments, Teresa. I uh, appreciate that. Now, I just want to go back to you, Tendai, um, just to try and bring it home because it will look like it's, it's theory that we are talking about here today, but we're privileged, we're so blessed to have uh, an incubator manager. Again, just to clarify to people, it's not incubator for chickens, but for businesses, for entrepreneurs. So Tendai, I just want you to, without giving up any business secrets. Can you just flag a few cases of entrepreneurship in your incubator so that people can know, and I know that most of these people are also called people, so that people can have an idea, the kind of breadth and length. I know we mentioned Zoom and Airbnb, which is, I mean, they, they are not people with two heads. They are like people like you and I, but starting from somewhere, like you rightly said, they started from incubator system. That is why I believe so much in what you do. And I'm hoping that more core people will realize the importance. Again, it goes back to what Teresa said about mentorship, research. So Tendai, tell us a little bit. Again, I don't, I, of course, you, you are a professional. You're not gonna give up business secret, but just to let people know that this is real entrepreneurship. Okay, if I uh, just wanted to comment briefly on what Monica said. Monica yeah. did highlight that the issue of being nervous. And um, this is something that we talked about in the last episode. And I think it's something that is very important. Again, it addresses some of the issues that we find here or in all our business incubators. A lot of people, before we even go to do market research or business plan, a lot of people are nervous or they are fearful. And I think this is a mindset issue. Can I do it? Me, can I do it? Can I do this business? Can I employ people? Can I make this amount of money? So I think the issue of mindset is something that has to be dealt with before we do any market research or before we do any business plan, one must have uh, the confidence that they can do this business. I don't, know, I, I, I don't know how I can stress this enough. The issue of mindset is the most important factor because a lot of people are risk averse. People are generally afraid of taking risk and it, it's normal as human beings we need to be mindful of something that can happen to us if we are not careful, if you don't plan things correctly. Which brings my next point again. Because of fear, a lot of people tend to think that this must be perfect. Oh. I want my business to be perfect. And just to give you that example here in the business incubator, you will see that no one will go out there to start the business because they want to make sure that the business plan is great. They want to make sure that the market research has been done well. The website is looking fantastic. Everything is clear. There are no mistakes, no grammatical errors. Everything is perfect. Oh, the policies and procedures, before we go out there, let's just make sure that our policies and procedures are done well. Once all these things are good, I think the thing that we always say in our business incubator is, go and test your market before you even want to rush to do the business plan to do the market research 
you want to do what we call the proof of concept. Let me see if there are two or three people who will say yes to my product. Before even going to do the market research, before even doing the business plan, you just want to see if this business is doable. Now, you are not making things complicated. You just want to see if there are other people who can buy your product or your service without getting into the details. So I think before we get the business cards, before we do the website, let's fix our mindset first. Let's just go and try the market to see if someone will be willing to pay something for whatever service that I'm providing or the product that I'm providing. And then we can start talking about the market research and the business plan. But after you have tested to see if there is an appetite for your product. And I think that's what is critical. The minimum viable product, that's what they call it, or the proof of concept. We just want to see if people would buy. I'm selling this cell phone, or I've just made a cell phone, but let me see if someone would want to buy it. Oh. Is there someone who wants to buy it? Before going and targeting everyone. So those are things that you can start doing. I like something that I was told by one uh, business guru. He said, when you are driving at night and your lights are on, headlights are on, you don't want to see the three kilometers journey that you are traveling. You only want to see 100 meters and then 100, the next 100 meters until you get to your destination. And this is the same thing that you need to apply in business. You don't need to see everything. You just need to see the first thing that you need to do. And then you do them. You go to the next ones. So most, most of us want to make sure that everything is perfect. And then they'll go into the market. But no such thing exists. You have to keep trying and changing things, get disappointed, but you continue doing those things. And that's the only way you can get to be successful. Wow. I know that uh, Teresa will want to say a few things there because you, you do have business to start off. What do you think? I think Tenda has made some very important points there, especially knowing that one of the objectives of this session yes. is hopefully somebody would have uh, been inspired to start somewhere. So Teresa, what do you think? Yes, I agree with Ndai. It's not always that you have to start when the business or the idea is perfect. You have to start somewhere. Even when uh, we... Teresa is having some... I found that as I go along, I'll either have some goals ticked off before time or sometimes I would to change. I think Teresa is having some technical challenges there. Are you still there, Teresa? Ephraim, hear me? Yes, you're back now. It looks like your internet was, was switching up a little bit there. Yes, please make your point again. My internet switching off, okay. So I was, uh, as I was saying, I was saying you don't have to be perfect or it doesn't have the business plan or the idea doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to have all the business um, business cards, all the uniforms ready before you even have a customer. And to test out the idea to see if someone will actually buy that, um, that uh, whatever service or product that you're selling. And you find that when you start, in a year's time, your idea might change. It might go a different direction or it might stay the same. So the only way you would find out what works and what doesn't work is when you start, when you actually start trading. Because on paper, it might seem right and that it's going to work. But when you actually go to do it, you might even find better ways of doing something or what 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 customers actually want, and that way you'll be able to pivot and uh, either add on to your services or change your services. So it's always important to start somewhere and not wait for when everything is all perfect. 
Thank you, Teresa. Thanks for that. Um, before I go to the, that point, I, I know that we still have one or two persons online. Um, if the person just want to say hello, shout out, add to the point, uh, because we always want to engage with our audience. While waiting for that, I just want to go back to our starting point because it's beginning to how this time flies so fast. So I just want to start for, to our starting point and that because we said a lot already. Well, I want us to bring it back to those key words. And I think those key words, especially the aspect of risk, is one of the things that is holding back called people. Now, I know it's not limited to people of multicultural migrant background, everybody, because doing a business, as you rightly, as you know, a, you don't have many Eric's and die, mm -hmm. <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> you don't have many three youths of the Airbnb, you know? Uh, so, but they took some risk. They did something about their mindset. And I think, Tendai, what you brought out today, that issue of mindset, uh, like I know some of some people may take this as a theological thing, but that's not the idea. That quote, the battle is won and lost in the mind. So how do we, as just in a, as we begin to round up, what can we, what are the big punch lines we can leave with people today, especially our main target audience, core people. I flagged the situation with China earlier on because we are here in Australia. I know people who watch these all around the world. But we have a situation now where, of course, this is not meant to be political, but we have a situation where needs are being generated. And I'm not talking of iron ore, because that was big. We're not talking of BHP, Chevron kind of space. Little, little made in China's. Can we have made in somewhere in Africa, made in somewhere? And I know this is like casting, going to the sky here, but hey, why don't we try? So how do we, what parting statement can we leave with people about that risk reward kind of challenge? Because many people just go back to status quo. Um, how can you leave that my nine to five? How, what if, uh, of course, when you have family, you know, that's times, times 10 of the challenges, you know, what if. So how, and that's how some ideas just die. They just <clears throat> die with time. So as, as a concluding pathway, what are the key punch lines we can leave for people, assuming one or two persons, even if not now, we'll see this later, who may be having ideas over time, who may have had ideas when they were young, growing up, who are born to be the Zoom owner, but somehow they are just fizzling away. Tenda and Teresa, let's have someone here. Can I start with Tenda again first, please? Okay, great. So, Ephraim, uh, you did mention nine to five, and I don't think we've got a problem uh, like a scarcity of ideas. I think a lot of people have got ideas, but the problem is acting upon those ideas. And now this involves risk taking, and that's what a lot of people are afraid of. Like, what will happen to my family if this doesn't succeed? Yeah or what will become of me. So I think the best thing to do it is, no one said you should just jump into this venture. I think the idea is to do it step by step. So you've got a, if you've got a nine to five job, how about you start your business as a part-time thing? Start it as a part-time gig. But one thing that you should know is you cannot have your cake 
and eat it too. So the moment you cut a slice of your cake, it means part of it is gone. Now, if you're doing a nine to five, then that means you need to create time to pursue your business. So that means after five o'clock, you need to start working on the other business. Because like I said, you can't have your cake and eat it too. So I think we should continue to work uh, on our business, but also continue with the nine to five. Then after that, when we start generating revenue and we see that it can replace uh, our nine to five job, then we can jump ship and then start doing uh, our, 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 our business idea on a full-time basis. So my point is there's nothing that can stop us from starting. I think it's high time we started, but let's do it as a part-time gig. Because taking risks which are not calculated is a very dangerous thing as well. So it's not just about taking risks. You have to take calculated risks. But by calculating those risks, it doesn't mean everything has to be perfect. You must be guaranteed of things. No, it ceases to be a risk. You still have to take the risk, but let it be calculated. Continue with your nine to five if you're worried about that. And then see if you can generate enough revenue that can replace your nine to five and then continue that on a full-time basis. Thank you so much. Before I, I know that uh, uh, definitely uh, Teresa is just going to come in soon. Uh, can I just say hello to Tanya from Zim, Zimbabwe? Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Please don't don't forget you can ask questions. You can add your own points. Who says some of the breakthroughs will not come from Zim? Please give us some ideas, Tan. Over to you, Teresa. Okay. Uh, Tandai has summed it up so well. Um, it's What I would add is that it's always important to know that when you venture out into uh, starting your own business, there's always some risk that you're going to take. Say, for example, uh, like Tandai said, if you've got a full-time uh, job, it means that you'd have to work on your business after hours. So the risk that you're taking on is that you won't have enough family time to spend with your family, but you'll be working on your uh, business. That is fine because you are progressing. You are doing something. You're being active in, um, doing, in doing something that will lead you um, somewhere. So the thing is that don't a lot of people are already doing something that would give them money or earn them some money, some extra income. They think it's a hobby, but they just don't know they can actually uh, provide that service to someone else that would pay them. So when if you've got a hobby or there's something that you enjoy, always think, how can I make money out of this? Test out if there'll be someone out there who will be willing to pay for your services. And a lot of the time this happens when this happens, uh, people or entrepreneurs like that are called accidental entrepreneurs because they were just doing something that they love. And before they know it, they start making money and they can't catch up. So we, when you have an idea or when you have um, a service that you can provide, give it a try. It may fail. That's still fine. Try and see how you can change it. So failing doesn't mean that uh, you, 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 you are not good or you can't do it. You just have to brainstorm and see how you can do it better, where you went wrong, uh, and uh, try and find ways that you can, um, you know, correct the situation to actually have a sustainable business. Oh, oh. Thanks, thank you so much, Teresa. Again, uh, I think that these are just key points that are being raised here. Um, I, I still just want to go back for the next one minute age. Uh, and uh, I couldn't get past that your point about a mindset. For me, that is that is big, actually. <laughs> you know, and I, I I did I did a session on our bridge about in the in the bridge network about um, 
um, you know, just just the whole thing about the the needs and motivation. Remember the Maslow's law, Maslow hierarchy of needs, which is classical, in that if you don't satisfy the basic needs, you may not be able to have that mindset to be thinking big. But this world that we are in, like you mentioned about those ordinary people, I'm just thinking of Eric. <laughs> I'm thinking of those youths, you know, they, they, they were, they were and they are still ordinary people, uh, Zoom and then Airbnb, and even look at Facebook, I know that one, we've used the story so much these days, they are ordinary people, but something about their mindset, so I want us to just round up with that, again, Remember our primary target audience, core people, people who have come over, who sometimes may have been forced, willingly or unwillingly, to do things that never was in their plan, like somebody that is really, really a, a sort of aeronautic engineer, high flyer in their countries of upbringing, and they come here, they end up with age care. Now, I'm not again. You guys know in MPB we don't we don't beat down on people. You have to rather I'd say those are courageous people because they need to take care of families, you know. But mindset: How do we encourage those kind of people? Because I think Australia needs us to really happen. That's why they ask us to come in, you know. So just. One minute each, if you don't mind, because now we are we're just three minutes left. <laughs> what what can you say about mindset? Let me start with Teresa first this time. Mindset. Yeah, mindset is very important. Uh, for you to be able to actually do something, you have to prepare yourself. You have to encourage yourself or have self belief that you can do it. For example, if you um decide to start become an entrepreneur you have to at least have time when you're open for business say for example if you've got a full-time job you should at least set away uh at least two hours in the evening where you actually work on your business or if not in the evening it could be in during the weekend when you set out time to actually work on your business and be persistent so if I start running a business and I don't chase up suppliers, I don't um, try and find customers, I don't do activities that will help my business progress, then I'm setting myself up for failure. So if I decide I'm going to be an entrepreneur and this is the service I'm going to provide, I should take steps and do activities that will help progress it forward. It's the way I behave that will, will uh, mean the difference between success and failure. So the more I'm doing, the more activities I'm doing in my business, the better or the, the, the high chances that I'm likely to succeed. Mm. Thank, thank you, Teresa. Pendai, just briefly, if you don't mind. Yes, I'm so glad that you brought it up. Now, it's so easy. The reason why I, I, I used an example of Eric, Zoom, and A, B, and B, I did that deliberately. Now, one would think, well, why are you bringing these big brands into this example? We want more practical examples. There's nothing more practical than those two examples that I just gave. Already, when someone thinks like that, it's a sign that it's a mindset issue. When you think that Zoom and Airbnb are not good examples. This is not practical. It's a good example that you've got mindset issues. Now, it's so easy to conclude that those are big brands, but if you understand how they got to where they, they are now, there were a lot of issues, a lot of heartbreaking moments. So what this means is one needs to be persistent regardless of what is happening around them. So I think mindset is not an event. Mindset is continual process of changing, heartbreaks coming your way,
but also but just persevering and continuing to do your business i just wish i know time is is just run out but i wanted to give another example i'm sure we can do it in another episode oh i think yes i think uh we could we could keep going uh but sorry again we've Usually, uh, we would try to round up before the one hour mark, but this is just so, it was so interesting. And I'm sure our, the people that will watch this later, uh, even those currently on online, will appreciate uh, our intention to finish earlier, but it's, it's, it was just so uh, good, the points that was made. Mindset is king. Um, before rounding up, I know there are still one or two persons online with us. Uh, we just want to say a quick hello. Can you can you give us a shout out? Just a few comments. Let's say hello to you as we as we round up. Um, but we appreciate you being with us today. I uh, hope hopefully you got a lot out of this session. Um, Again, this is being brought by uh, Multicultural Professional Bridge. Uh, if you if you can later on, you can check us out, uh, even so that you don't miss what we are doing today. Uh, subsequently, you can uh, subscribe to our various media channel. Uh, but we really appreciate. Uh, you today. Oh, Catherine, Catherine just joined us. I know she's usually a regular. Thank you so much, Catherine. We're just rounding up now. Hopefully you can watch the full version later on. But once again, thank you so much, Catherine, for, for taking time to join us. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we will definitely keep bringing this kind of topics. Everything we try to bring here, we try to make it relevant. But I just want, once again, just want to thank Teresa. Uh, please, if you can, check her out later on. Uh, she does a lot with helping start up business. Uh, like I said earlier on, uh, Tendai is, is, is an incubator manager for business station. They do a lot in that business station. A lot goes on there. You can check them out. Um, but I really want to appreciate them taking time to be with us today on this session. Uh, for me, I think one way I just want to introduce myself today, you can check out, I do write a few things just around this area. My latest book, The Adopter That Achieve, I really try to talk about this as well. The good things that the two people I have on stage, they are big supporter of what I do in that space. But check them out if you want to, but it's something we would like to do. I perceive Tenda and Teresa, this will not be your last year. <laughs> it looks like we still have unfinished business. This is the second one. I really want to thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa. Thank you. I, I do not take this for granted. You could have been doing a lot with your client but you made our time to be with me today. Thank you so much, Teresa. Thank you so much. My pleasure. You're welcome. Yeah, and also Tendai. Tendai is, is, is really doing a lot in the business space. Uh, I still want to say uh, it's not by accident that it's here. Tendai incubates. You know what incubator means? To, <laughs> to make sure that businesses don't die. <laughs> so... That's, that's his role, and I have been where he is working. He is passionate about what he does. Tendai, thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you, Ephraim. All right. I, I wish we could keep going, but thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us again. Uh, once again, can we do a Q&A version next time? Very good point. I think we may have to consider that, Catherine, that's a very good point, so that uh, we can take what people want to ask rather than telling what we think. I think we set some good grounding right now for court premiums uh, by the topic of today, because I thought we needed to do this today, and I feel good that we've done this. I think we've done justice. Uh, yes, Catherine, is passionate about the point she's making. 
the audience prepares questions and the panel answer the full hour. Uh, good point. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you very much. We appreciate you. Uh, so yes, sorry, I know I said bye bye many times. It goes to show how passionate this program is. Thank you once again, Teresa. Thank you, Tendai. And uh, for everyone that will watch this later, thank you for joining us. We look forward to next session. Subscribe so that you don't miss the updates. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.